They give me high fives every week. They won't leave church until they come and give me a high five, and so that's a blessing. Um, I was here, I think, with you all back in December. Is that right? Maybe December. And I tell you what, you all don't slow down. Since I was here last, uh, Micah is married now. Seth had his, uh, the, the new babies here. I just got to see the little fella, and, uh, which is a blessing. And so happy to be here again. Love you all. Pastor Mark is a dear friend, and he uh, befriended me years ago when I was a new pastor at the pastor's conference that we just left and um, has been encouraging me ever since. So with all that said, with the time we have left, we want to dive into the word. So uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 is where we will be tonight. And we'll cover as much as we can with the time that we actually have. How are y'all feeling? Everybody good? All right. I'm, I'm glad to be standing. I've been sitting for days and then riding from Northeast Maryland down to uh, Fredericksburg. I'm, I'm happy to be standing. So Isaiah chapter 1, we'll read the first verse and then we'll pray and then we'll dive in. If you're there with me, say amen. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Lord, we do thank you tonight for allowing us to be here. Father, I do pray that as we turn our hearts now to your word, to what you would say, Lord, it's so sweet and refreshing to hear your word. There's so many things being said today, so many things that are going on, Lord, and uh, let us as the church not neglect to open our hearts frequently and often to you, Lord, as you speak so clearly through your word to the church, individually and collectively, through the age, Lord. And as you say in your word that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will by no means, not one jot or tittle will pass away. And I thank you for that, Lord. And so, Lord, uh, as we approach it now, I pray that you would remove everything that is from our hearts and our minds, the, the burdens of this life, the cares of this world, the things that we've endured in the workplace, in the classrooms, in the homes, and, and on the highways, and in, in different situations, Lord God, as you've called us to occupy until you come. But now at this time that you would allow us to turn our whole attention to you, that you would take this hour as your own, that you would speak to us by your spirit as only you can, individually and collectively, Lord. We do pray for Pastor Mark and his travels. Lord, I pray for his family. I pray for the leadership of this church, Lord God, lifting them up before you, Lord, as the, the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few. The work is needful. It is needful. I thank you for Calvary Chapel and its diligence to teach your word. I pray that here in Fredericksburg, you would continue to do an amazing work through the people that are gathered in this place week in and week out. I pray your blessings upon them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and say together, amen, amen. So Isaiah chapter 1, as we dive in, you know, one of the things that we have to always uh, draw our attention back to is the, the need for God's word to go forth in the, in the, in the earth and in all the world. And, and I think sometimes we can, we can forget that. You know, the Bible is important to wash us, to cleanse us, to strengthen us, to keep our focus in the right direction. Amen. One of the things we see that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians is that the church is being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And when you think about the foundation that's been laid by the apostles and the prophets, that that foundation is the word of God itself. Because the apostles spoke with an authority and wrote with an authority that does not exist in the church today. They completed the canon of scriptures, and no one today has the authority to speak as the apostles did the apostles of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, because of that, we have a sure foundation that is unmovable, which is the word of God, amen? Now we have something to stand on, something to rest on, something that protects us, something that gives us direction, something that gives authority in the church and allows us to understand what we should be doing, how we should function, and how we should deal with the things that come up concerning our lives in the church, and we're thankful for that. And so even now as we turn our hearts to it, The thing that we see with Isaiah is that he's receiving a vision. It's a prophecy. Isaiah is the first of the major prophets as we begin, if if you were studying through the Bible uh, in order of the canon that we have, he would be the beginning of, of the prophetic books as we know them. 
which is really, really good. And Isaiah, interestingly enough, receives this vision. Sometimes people spend a lot of time trying to figure out, how did Isaiah receive the vision? You ever wondered that? Anybody ever wondered, how did God speak to the prophets? Yeah. How many of you would say that you've heard God speak to you at some point in your Christian life? Raise your hand if you're a disciple, and that's most of you. So I don't think we need to spend too much time trying to figure it out. What we understand is God actually speaks, doesn't he? Man, I, I think you, you got to think about it. God does not have to speak in sense of necessarily always a thought in your mind or always a feeling or an emotion. But literally, God can speak so powerfully that he literally speaks in you, and you can recognize it. You know, and we do love that. And in fact, I was reminded of one time we were evangelizing down in South America. And I hope I didn't tell you this story last time you were here. But anyway, if I did, forgive me. That's why I have gray hair. That's my excuse. I can do that. And uh, I remember um, we were on the mountain. We were evangelizing. There was a lady that came down the mountain um, with her son for medical help. And she was down in the city. And and we were evangelizing, and, and there's a lot of, a lot of idolatry there, and um, people set up Catholic shrines, a, a statue of a, of a saint or Mary or someone, and they offer things to it. They put out flowers. They, they write requests, and, and they put there. They burn candles. They all, do all those things, but they don't know Christ. And I remember we were evangelizing. I was speaking to her through a, a uh, translator, Juan Carlos, and he was talking to her, and he was giving her what I was saying. And um, we were talking about God, this God who she didn't know, and all of a sudden, This impression in me so strong, God said, tell her about my love. And so I just knew it was God, and I began to talk about that. And then Juan Carlos turned to me, and he said, she's ready. And I said, what do you mean? Is she ready to receive the Lord? He's like, yes. And I said, well, then you take it from there in Spanish. You know, (laughs) he did. And he led her to the Lord, and she received the Lord. And uh, we connected her with the other ladies that were there from the church there in Columbia. But, But God just made this impression in me. God does speak. And here he spoke to the prophet Isaiah. One of the things I, I want to mention to you, there's a couple of things. The Bible tells us over in Revelation 19.10 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Do you understand? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? Well, it means that prophecy doesn't always have to be predictive in nature. It's the foretelling of God's truth. But it never contradicts who Jesus is. In fact, John says we're to test the spirits to see of what sort they are. Because any spirit that doesn't confess that Jesus came in the flesh is not of God. Y'all know that, right? First John chapter 4. Y'all with me? Okay, if you nod and let me know you're getting it, it goes a lot easier for everybody in the room. All right. So, all right. We understand that. Peter says it this way. I'm giving you these. I want you to write them down for the sake of time. I won't have you turn. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21... Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I love that. No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. So much so that God always confirms even his prophecy. And If you were to study through Isaiah chapter 2, you get a section of Scripture where he is pointing ahead to things that are concerning Israel in the last days going into the millennium. And Micah, another contemporary prophet, prophesies the exact same words. Prophecy doesn't come from the will of man, but it comes from the will of God. The Bible tells us that God moved upon holy men of old by his spirit, and they wrote Scripture. That all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for who? us, for the man of God, that we may be complete, fully furnished, meaning that we should lack nothing. And so I think it's interesting as you begin to look at the prophetic books, and we look here in this verse, chapter 1, verse 1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, not Amos the prophet, but Amos, which he saw, notice concerning Judah and Jerusalem. I won't spend a lot of time here. Judah and Jerusalem, the nation of Israel was divided at this point between the ten northern tribes and the, and the two in the south, Judah and Benjamin. We won't spend a lot of time there. But he, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, notice in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And I don't have time to develop a lot of that tonight. But what I would say is this. Listen to me very carefully. Isaiah prophesied through four administrations, if you will, of Israel, Judah, actually. Four administrations. Just stay with him for a moment. So through, through four leaders, Isaiah is on the scene. 
He's seeing all of the things that's going on. He's doing the ministry God has given him that spans four administrations. And I, I, you know, I'm 40-something years old. I remember way back, I remember President Reagan. I remember President Carter, both Bushes, uh, Clinton. I remember all of those different presidencies in my lifetime. I remember being a child and hearing the president speak from the TV. And, and, and stuff in the house sometimes would kind of slow down and we kind of hear what he would have to say. I remember the State of the Union addresses. That's before everybody had cell phones and stuff that distracted them. I remember all of those things, and, and I remember through the years. And so Isaiah's ministry spans four generations of leadership in Judah. He saw a lot. Now, I want to divide the chapter this way, and we need to move fast. I'm going to give you three sections because we can't, contain, we can't do much more than that in the time we have. So if you're writing and taking notes, here's a three-part outline for tonight. Are you ready? All right, first part, the state of the union. And we're going to see that in verses 2 through 9. The state of the union or the state of Judah in the city of Jerusalem. We're also going to see, and you could say in the midst of that, we're going to see the failing church within. The failing church within in verses 10 through 20. And then we're going to see a corrupt society in verses 21 through 26. One of the things that kind of comes through this, though, and this is the scary part. Now, now, listen to me. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that the Old Testament is written as an example to us. In other words, the, that the direct interpretation of these texts involve the things that happened in Judah and Jerusalem during the time of Hezekiah, the prophet. You with me? Okay. And the application of that, we see, is to help us understand what God was speaking to them. But however, because it's written as an example to us, we can take application today for ourselves because we can learn from God's dealing with Judah and Jerusalem and even how he dealt with them through the word of the prophet. And so as we see this, the state of the union Verses 2 through 9, the failing church within, verses 10 through 20, the corrupt society, verses 21 through 26, it begins to dawn on me that there's something that we, the believers of today, if you will, often when they use the word church, old, old commentators, commentaries, they would use the word church to describe the believers in the nation of Israel. It doesn't reflect the church today, okay? I just want you to know that. But what I see as I look at this is the fact that the church today lives in a time where we see a lot of things going on in the land that we live in, and there is, I believe, still a prophetic voice that needs to sound in the earth, and it always should come from the people of God who believe in God, who are, if you will, uh, constantly consuming God's word and being transformed by it that we would be the ones in the earth today that should have something to say that should impact the people in the, in the land around us. And I want you to think as we begin to go through this tonight about where you live, where you work, where you do life. I mean, this is an interesting church. I feel very safe here. You know, we're right down the road from Quantico and, you know, not far from the uh, nation's capital where decisions that affect our entire world take place. And even some of you here may be uh, being government employees. Maybe some of the people that go to this church are part of the intelligence community. I really don't know. But as I think about Isaiah and I think about uh, uh, Daniel and I think about the prophets of old and I think about the positions that they sometimes found themselves in and wherever they were, they had to be ready and prepared to speak forth the word of God. Do you know that the church, Jesus said, is the salt of the earth? Okay, and we know salt is a preservative, right? Y'all know that? It's an antiseptic. It, it preserves things. You know, I grew up in the country. We, used, we would preserve things by using different, different uh, uh, substances to keep them, uh, canning them, whatever, put them up for a long time. It's an antiseptic. It keeps things from, from decaying. And Jesus describes us that way. Our presence on the earth, listen, our presence on the earth should be making a difference. 
Paul describes over in Thessalonians that now we know what's restraining, but when he's taken out of the way, meaning when the church leaves, that's kind of it. Jesus says we are the light of the world. That means we, we are the God, if you will, a beacon of light in a dark, hopeless world. That's what the church is. And we're the ones who have the greatest message that the earth will ever receive. It's in us. So where do you go? And here's the question. Are you the prophet? Are you the prophet in the cubicles that you occupy, in the shops that you occupy, in the classrooms that you either teach in or attend, in in the marketplaces, in the communities that you live? Are you the prophet of God there who speaks forth the word of God with clarity and love and compassion? Because that's who we're called to be in these last days. We are the church. And so he says, let's look at the state of the union and see some of the things that God says here. Let's pick it up in verse 2. Notice in verse 2 as we continue. And we begin to go through this. He begins to say here, hear, O heavens, notice, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. And, and this is Isaiah speaking for him. And so he declares that the heavens and the earth should even take note of what is being said. Now, that's kind of scary in a sense because if you remember over in Romans, y'all don't mind turning. Do y'all turn sometimes? Is that Okay. Okay, I I love this. It it brings me to Romans chapter 8 in my mind. Just really quick, keep your finger where we are. Flip over to Romans chapter 8 and uh, and see what Scripture says there. We believe that God will speak as we do this. Turn quickly. If you don't want to turn, you can listen to me read, and it's okay. I'm going to read a couple of verses. I'm going to pick it up, Romans chapter 8, verse 19, where Paul says, For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God. Even creation itself is waiting for something to happen. The revelation of the sons of God. And I believe the sons he means there is the people of God who are filled with his spirit. The Bible says that we are sons of God because we have the spirit of God within us. Okay? Y'all with me? He goes on to say, For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, though. But because of him who subjected it in hope, he says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Uh, It's very interesting. Do you understand when man sinned, all creation suffered? Y'all with me? And you know that simply because the earth is not what it was intended to be. This is not what God originally created. God did not create this mess that we see. We did. Adam did. Our sin did. God created a beautiful earth that was immaculate. And you can read through Genesis and and just see all of the glorious things that are being described. There's a paradise, the whole globe. And he says here, creation itself, he says, because creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. So Isaiah said, creation, listen, you're going to be blessed by this too, you know, in a sense. Everybody take note. God sees what's going on, and God is dealing with it. He says here, so, O heavens, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken back in Isaiah chapter 1. He says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, when I read Scripture, and you're going to hear this throughout this first section, when I read Scripture, I like to listen for the heart of God. You know, what's God's heart? You know, where the, God is not emotional so much, but we do see emotion come from him. God gets angry. You know, God grieves. The Holy Spirit grieves, and we can grieve the Holy Spirit rather. You know, and so we see his heart here. He says, listen, I've nourished and I've brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. And he's talking about Israel, his people who he led out of Egypt with the mighty hand. He left Egypt devastated. He destroyed or killed the firstborn in Egypt, and Israel left with the spoil. He parted the sea and drowned Pharaoh's army. He gave water from a rock. He gave uh, manna to just show up in the morning. They got quail, which is actually pretty good if you've never had it. And in all of the miracles that they saw, he gave them all of those things. He said, I've nourished them. I've brought up children, but they rebelled against me. Verse 3, notice, he says, the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider it. I think it's very interesting 
how I grew up in a rural area. I grew up in, uh, on farmland. And it's very interesting how animals will find their way back home. We kind of had a rule where I'm from, you know, growing up in, in farmland. Um, animals were, uh, you know, being born all the time. And sometimes my dad would hit his threshold. And so an animal would have to go for a ride. Y'all forgive me. This is old school. Anybody? <laughs> So an animal, and I'm like, Dad, no, because I loved every puppy that was born, so they would have to go for a ride. The rule was if that puppy found his way back home, to, to, then, he, then that was it. We feed him. He's, you know, he's, he's home. It's amazing how many of them would find their way back. There's a story Pastor Chuck likes to tell about uh, a, uh, a donkey that was left at the scene of the crime. And so the investigating Police, uh, police officer said, well, let the donkey go, and they followed don- donkey back to the house of the thief. <laughs> I don't know if it's a true story, but it's amazing that animals have a knack to do that. And, and he says here, and God is like, listen, he says the ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib. The donkey knows where to go back home where the food is at. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider, God says. This is the state of the nation. He says, alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquities, a brood of evildoers. Wait a minute. This is Israel, his beloved, the nation that he loves. He calls them a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children of who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the anger of the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward, away from everything that he has done. And notice his heart again, verse 5. Listen to his heart. He says, why should you be stricken again? Why should you be? You have a loving God who provides for you. Why should you go through punishment? Why should you be, if you will, punished and disciplined by me again, he says. Now, as you read verses 5 and 6, you got you to catch this. God is sovereign. God knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. God knows everything that's coming before us, and that's why when he speaks, when the Holy Spirit warns, we need to listen. Why should you be stricken again? Here's why. God knows. Because you will revolt more and more. You know, a lot of times we have to understand that God already knows what's going to happen. It's difficult, I think, as I watch Jesus in the Gospels as he speaks with people, yet he knows the heart of man. As he looked into the eyes of Judas, yet knowing that there was no way that he was going to save Judas, Judas was going to rebel. You know, yet God is so loving that even in this rebellion, he's telling them, I'm going to have to deal with you. You will revolt more and more. He says the whole head is sick. This is the state of the nation. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faints from the sole of the foot entirely. Listen, from the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. God can look through and through and see the whole thing. He says there's nothing but wounds and bruises. And notice he says, and putrefying sores. That means sores that no longer uh, have the ability to be healed. There's no way for them to begin to be healed. They're beginning to rot and stink. And this is God's view of them. They have not been closed or bound or soothed with ointment. He says, "I, I see it. Why should you be stricken again? Because you will rebel more and more and more. And of course, God will deal with Israel, Isaiah prophesying ahead of many of the things that we know that's going to come, the, 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 the uh, invasions of Assyria, Babylon, the captivity of 70 years in Babylon, all of that to come after all of Isaiah's prophecies. You know, the thing about it is I understand, listen, I understand that God knows me, and he knows everyone around me. He knows everything that I go through. Just like as parents... We don't know everything, but by the Spirit of God, young people who are in here tonight, your parents speak with wisdom that comes from the Lord pleading for your life. And there are things that you just won't understand, and you just can't see it. And it's it's, it's not that you're not uh, smart. It's just your parents, the things that they just understand is they plead for you on their knees with tears, begging before the Lord, because all they care about is you knowing Jesus and you living a life for him. Nothing else matters. In the heart of a parent, you know, it's great if you become doctors and lawyers. That's cool, too. (laughs) But mainly that you not stray away from Jesus. And they cry out. They warn you. They point out things and people that maybe are not good for you. And and you got to learn to listen. 
This is the heart of God for the nation of Israel. And he says, verse 7, I need to pick up the pace. I'm running out of time. Verse 7, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land. And one of the things, um, as we go through these kings, um, the king probably during the time, Ahaz, that they were doing this, Ahaz had turned so far away from Israel, and Isaiah is not chronological, by the way, that he had begun to make treaties with the other nations, and, and the nations begin to come in and take a spoil and even invade the land. Notice he says, your country is desolate, verse 7. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land. Notice in your presence, and you can't do anything about it. They're in your land, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. But check this out. It's always, Isaiah always leaves a ray of hope. Verse 9, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant. I love that. God always has a remnant, doesn't he? We know that even when uh, Elisha the prophet was in the cave and he was whining, and, uh, and, 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 and God says, hey, what are you doing here, Elisha? And he says, well, I've, I've ran. They've killed all your prophets. I'm the only one that escaped. I'm the only one alive. God says, not so. I've got 5,000 that have never burnt, uh, bowed the knee to Baal or kissed them. In other words, I've got peoples. <laughs> now, you get up and go do what I've called you to do. And God always has a remnant. And it's, 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 I love that. God, it's not all about us. God always has a remnant left, even for the nation of Israel. And he says here, unless God had left a, a, a remnant, he says at the end of verse 9, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. It's very interesting. We would have been like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Well, we know what happened to them. God smoked them. None of you have ever booked a vacation to Gomorrah. None of you have ever stopped in to visit Sodom. It got smoked. It doesn't exist anymore. And so... Let's look at the next section, the failing church. Because whenever the, the state of the union is bleak, whenever times are rough, what the church, what we need to learn to do, what the, what the body of believers here, it was those in Israel that were supposed to believe, I applied even to us today, is to not spend time complaining and murmuring against what's going on. It's to be on our knees praying for and then being the prophet in the country we live in. Notice he says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Now, I just told you, Sodom's no longer on the scene. The prophet is speaking, if you will, uh, sarcastically. He's, he's making a point. He says here, you rulers of Sodom, give ear to the law of God, you people of Gomorrah, speaking to Judah, trying to draw them to a point. Verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude, listen, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Now, wait a minute. There's a multitude of sacrifices. Well, wait a minute. If, if the state of the union is rough and bleak, you would think that there wouldn't be a multitude of sacrifices. But God says there's a multitude of sacrifices in the midst of, of a nation that's corrupt and going downward. Let's keep watching. He says, what purpose is your multitude of sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. In other words, they are performing the law, it sounds like, in abundance. Notice what he says. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts, bring no more futile sacrifices. He says your sacrifices are futile. They have no meaning. He says incense is an abomination to me. Well, he instructed them to burn incense in his presence. Notice the new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and a sacred meeting. He says you're meeting, you're keeping all the new moons, all the feasts, all the seasons. You're showing up constantly, and you're burning sacrifices, and you're burning incense. You're doing all of this stuff, but I can no longer bear, check it out, iniquity and the assembly. The church is failing. The body of believers was full of sin, yet if you looked at what they were doing, it would look like something amazing was happening. There was smoke rising from the altar. There was incense in the holy place. Sacrifices were happening. Assemblies were meeting all the time. I think about the nation that we live in, mega churches. Everybody's driving to church. Everybody's showing up like clockwork, you know, not always on Wednesday nights, I understand. 
Only the faithful on Wednesday nights. <laughs> That's everywhere you go. He says, I can't endure it. Iniquity and the sacred meeting, there need, can't be both. God says something has to change. I can't endure this any longer. You come in, you're sacrificing, you're going through all of these motions, you're doing all of this stuff, and diligently, there's an abundance of these things, he says. He says, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. And God doesn't often say that he hates things, but he's saying that he hates these things, the appointed feasts, their new moons. They're a trouble to me. Notice, I am weary of bearing them. Then he says this, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Now, the spreading out of the hands, when the Jews would pray, they take a different posture maybe than we do. Um, often they would bow their heads and they would lift their eyes to heaven. Jews would worship that way. Lift their, excuse me, their hands to heaven. And so the Lord says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. In other words, you're praying, you're coming, and you're going through the motions of making prayers, abundant sacrifices. A lot of money was being spent to have sacrifices. All of the things, the outward things, listen, don't, 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 don't let me lose you. This is a short Wednesday night. So not, not, we're not going to be here long. Stay focused. All of these things were going on. And he says, when you pray, I'm not listening. That's what he's saying to them. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear, verse 15. Why? Your hands are full of blood. I believe that the state of Judah was so bad because the body of believers was corrupt and failing. There was iniquity. There was sin. They were going through the motions. And before we continue in this section, I have to say to us tonight, here on a Wednesday night, the faithful ones, we're here. But I think the thing that we need to understand is this needs to be, even this, the church, the New Testament church, this needs to be real. This needs to be sincere. And we always have to, listen, we always have to examine ourselves. The Bible says New Testament, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Am I, am I at a point where I can walk in the church with known sin in my life? And go through the motion. Maybe it's because we're waiting for something big to happen. You know, the Bible says God prefers obedience over sacrifice. God is not far from us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. God is waiting. He desires for us to come before him and be very real. And I think we should examine ourselves tonight because if there's any one of us in this room with known sin in our lives, then tonight we need to do something about it as much as they need to do it in Judah. Because in this time that we live in, if the church is failing and there's no hope for the land, we are the light of the world. We are the salt. But if the salt loses, I love Jesus. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. He's on the mountain sitting down talking to his disciples. And he says, well, if the salt loses its saltiness, then how, we're, how is it going to be salty? You know, I just, just simple but straightforward. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I like salt peanuts. I don't like plain peanuts, you know? And I just think about stuff I like with a little something on, a little flavor. You, you follow what I'm saying? I like a little flavor in things. Well, Jesus is saying I like my folks to have a little flavor. But sin takes the flavor away. And, and, and so if we, the, the, the church, if we're losing that zeal, that flavor, that, that something that comes with, with us being righteous and holy before God... Then, then, that, then what is that going to do for the rest of the world? If, you know, he says, no one lights a candle and sticks it under a basket. He says, I have lit you for you to shine, not for you to be put out. That's what he says to the New Testament church. And, and I think about this. We were doing an outreach, and this is kind of where all of this came from in my head, I guess. We were doing an outreach uh, on Saturday before Easter in the park. We... Um, this is one of the simplest outreaches you can do, actually. It's just an Easter egg hunt. We put a bunch of stuff out on Facebook, and people came from everywhere. You know anybody wants to bring their kids to Easter egg hunts, I'm talking about, in the, in the community that, of nonbelievers, people from other religions, people that don't know, have any, any understanding of God or Jesus will show up for an Easter egg hunt. I don't even understand why, but they came. 
And so when it was time to deliver the gospel, we delivered the gospel to the kids through the puppet show. And when it was time for me to get up and do the gospel over, over the open air, and I looked at the crowd of people, and it dawned on me, the church, we're responsible for the people in this community to an extent. Now, you're going to see that as we go through. Because they come here, we have the answers of life and hope. And, it, it, and we have to be responsible and diligent to handle this thing right. And so we got to prepare ourselves. So first, verse 16, the answer to the failing church, he says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean, he says to Israel. Cleansing was big in the Old Testament. Anytime the, the, the Jewish people would come to worship, the men would go through a, a cleansing process before they could come in and worship. Even the priests, when they went into the tabernacle to do their ministry, they would wash first before they would do their ministry. It was a picture of being cleansed. So he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. How do we wash ourselves and make ourselves clean? Well, first of all, Jesus said to Peter, you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Jesus was getting ready to um, uh, wash the disciples' feet. And Peter says, you nah, Lord, you, you're, not, you're my Lord. I'm not, you're not washing my feet. So Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you have no part with me. So then Peter says, well, give me a whole bath, Lord. And the Lord says, no, no, I only need to wash your feet because you know, you know, you're, 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 you're already clean. I've already given you the, 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 the thorough bath you need. It's kind of like this. Here's the picture. My family loves to go to the beach. And um, if you ever, how many of you like going to the beach, by the way? Okay, good. That's half the room. All right. Here's the thing that happens when you go to the beach. You go, you enjoy the beach, you leave the beach, you stop off by the showers and take a shower. Y'all with me? Okay, I know y'all are tired from work, but stay with me. Okay. You take your shower, you clean off. How many of you can get to your car and drive home without any sand getting in your car? Raise your hand if you can do it. I dare you to test it. You will find sand for the next six months in places you never thought sand would be. It's impossible. Likewise, as a believer, it's impossible to live and work and interact with the world that we live in and not be defiled to some degree. And so, therefore, in order to be made clean, we need to become before a holy God on a regular basis and allow ourselves to be washed in his holy word and in his presence and amongst the fellowship of the saints. He says, wash yourselves. And really, it speaks of something. It speaks of repentance. God is calling us to church to repentance. One of the prophets says that judgment starts in the house of the Lord because if we, the church, are not real before a holy God, then the rest of this isn't useless. And then we know God's plan is going gonna, is gonna to unfold no matter what. It doesn't all depend upon us. But how much more impactful when we turn to the Lord. So he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away evil from, uh, evil from your doing and before your eyes. Now notice, uh, he says, cease to do evil. Now notice verse 17. Listen to this. Because there are times when we, we got to understand something about the church and the world today as it speaks to making changes in the world. We know that we're not called to uh, humanitarian efforts and social reform as a primary objective of the church. We know that, right? We make changes through the preaching of the gospel and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. We understand that, right? Yet, in the midst of all of that, there are times, he says, look at verse 17, learn to do good, but he says, seek justice. He says, rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. You know, as I, I look at my town and I was meeting with the school teacher, and the school teacher saying there's only three men that work in her elementary school. And the boys of the school respond different to the, to the men than they do the ladies in the school. And that's just common sense. I mean, it's just men make men, you know. And it's difficult for single moms for that reason. There's a, a community that we were trying to adopt, a, a HUD community. And we were there, uh, my assistant pastor and I, meeting with the director of this HUD community. And she has 48 com homes in that community. And out of 48 of them, uh, it's 90, I would say maybe 85% single moms and elderly. There are only five out of the 48 homes that have an intact family. And I, I'm, I don't want to go too far into this. And, you know, um, we're looking to adopt that community and, and do ministry there on a regular basis. He says, defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. 
This is one of the things he's calling the body of believers to do in a corrupt society. The church does have a voice. There are times when we have to be the only hope that this world will see. We bring them the only hope that exists, and that's Christ. Come now, as I got to pick up the pace here, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Oh, man, isn't that beautiful? Now, here's the hope of God. Come let us reason? You mean you're not going to smoke us like Sodom and Gomorrah? (laughs) No. God would say that even to your heart tonight. Come and let us reason because he loves you, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as, as wool. He speaks of the great transformation that comes even when the body of believers turns to the Lord. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse, he's talking to Judah, and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. And, of course, he says, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And, of course, they they did rebel, and the Lord had to deal with them. And we don't have time to go into all that, and he does deal with them. But I do believe as I look at this and I think about the church today, and I, I think about, you know, with Billy Graham is gone. And see, Billy Graham is the one who said this. He said, if God doesn't judge America, then he's going to owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the days to come. And so I want to be respectful. Pastor Mark ends at 8, and I'm, I want to wrap up here. I think that for us, We are more precious in his sight than we realize. We are more needful on this earth than we realize. And see, what we have to be very careful about, and and, and I'm teaching Ephesians 6 on Sunday. We're looking at spiritual warfare, and spiritual warfare is very real because one of the things Satan wants to do is distract you from your purpose in this life. We as believers, we shouldn't be looking at what is my purpose, what is my purpose. No, all you need to find out is what your spiritual gift is and where God has stationed you. It's very simple for us. Because the, the thing is, for us, if we allow ourselves to get distracted with the things of this world, then we're not being productive for God. God is, listen, God wants to use you right where you are, starting off, right where you are. In this church, Calvary Chapel is needful. We're not the only thing. God, the, the church is very diverse, and I'm thankful for that. And I'm actually, I, I am someone who believes in unity. I preach unity and I love that I try my best to spend time with other pastors, and I'm comfortable around pastors of other denominations as well because what I have begun to find is this. If we cut ourselves off from the rest of the church, check this out, listen. If we as Calvary Chapel begin to cut ourselves off from the rest of the church, then the church is missing something or is not as whole as it should be. You follow what I'm saying? We shouldn't be afraid of that because we bring something to the table that the rest of the church needs. We bring the balance. I can hang out with the Pentecostals because, and, 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 I, honestly, I like them. You know? <laughs> I like the Pentecostals. And then when they get weird, I'll just tell them, hey, you're being a little weird. <laughs> it, it don't take all that. You know? And it's okay. We can have fun. But at the same time, you know, and I can hang out with the conservatives. I just have issues when they don't believe in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And I say, well, then you're dead. What are you doing? You might as well close shop because if the Holy Spirit ain't there, you ain't doing nothing. You know, and we bring some kind of balance because we understand this, number one, and this is what, what, what we bring to the table. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is we have a voice. This church can impact this community in amazing ways. You all, as you fan out tomorrow, everywhere you go, that's why you come here to be strengthened in fellowship and in the word of God to understand who you are and what God has called you to do so that he can then set you ablaze the night so that when you go out, you know, your lamp is, is trimmed a little bit, you know. See, growing up, and I'm going to end y'all, I promise, but growing up in the, um, in the South, we had uh, oil lamps that would hang on the wall or sit on the shelf somewhere because when the storms came and the power went out, well, we'll just get that thing and light it. You know, this is before um, we had flashlights too. I'm not that old, but, but, <laughs> but we had the oil lamps. But the thing about an oil lamp, it, you know how it grows dim? Any, some of you know, okay? Maybe look it up on YouTube or something. If you don't do anything, they grow dim, 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 and then it finally goes out. You have to do something to it to keep it burning bright. That's what they had to do in the tabernacle. The priest had to go in every morning and trim the lamp. Well, that's what tonight is about. It's about trimming the lamp of your life because you're the light of the world. God is just kind of 
you know, getting that extra stuff off tonight through the word and through fellowship to get you a little brighter and sending you back out. You have a place in this world. The church has a place in this world. And so I, I, my heart is always to encourage the, to encourage the church of those things because it, we won't understand it until we get to eternity. And that's when you'll see how much of an impact you actually had, how much the little things that you've done have impacted people, have grown the kingdom. And Jesus says a cup of water given in his name will by no means go forgotten. And so you've got to understand how precious your life is. See, the battle, the spiritual warfare, the battle the real battle is that Satan wants to hinder you, slow you down, distract you, because he can't defeat you. And that's what he's trying to do. And so let's pray as we're over time. Father, we do thank you tonight, Lord, for your word. I pray for every soul in this place, even the little infants in the nursery. I thank you for everybody here at Calvary Chapel of Fredericksburg. I pray your protection. I pray your guidance, your leading of them, Lord God, that you would do a special thing here amongst these people, Lord God, that you would constantly, constantly make it known in their hearts who they are to you and how precious they are, Lord. And I pray for them as they go out into the community and uh, to work. Be with them in their cars, in their homes, in, their mar- in the marketplaces, the classrooms, everywhere that they go, Lord God. Go before them and clear a path, Lord God. Let your angels be encamped around their homes even tonight as they sleep. Lord God, protect the body of people even back home at our church in Clayton. Lord, we love you. We thank you for who you are and everything that you're doing in our lives. And in Jesus' name, we say together, saints, amen. Let's stand and sing. Let's go ahead and stand.